the old border crossing into East Berlin, or maybe even the Black Gate into Mordor. But instead, entering the bad place was as easy as stepping out of a taxi cab, at least at first. From what the guardian Lame had planted in my memory, I knew I must be in the Abaddon levels, somewhere in the upper middle of hell. But if this was upper middle, I knew for sure I didn't want to visit anything lower. Because even before I could see any of it, I could smell it. Abaddon stank. I don't mean simple, ordinary foul odors like shit or rotting meat. I mean a combination of every foul smell that biology and geology could create, blended into a heady bouquet that combined not only all that a nose would normally detest, but wafts of things so odd and, and, and unexpected, like copper and burning hay, just to throw out a couple of examples, that I simply could not get used to it. I never really did, either. The architects of the underworld were, excuse the pun, fiendishly clever. They knew that a single stench, or even a million unchanging stenches, can become familiar after a while. But small changes can keep anything new, no matter how horrible. As long as I was there, I never learned to ignore the stink. As I left the bridge behind and walked through the swirl of stinging acid mist, voices filled the hot, damp, near darkness. Some human, some animal, some horribly in between. Shrieks, moans, arguments, even tatters of laughter that sound as though it sounded as though they had been jerked painfully out of whatever spawned them. The noise of the dam. Pretty much what you'd expect. The air was horribly hot and slimy, muggy as the worst August day in the New York subway, times a thousand. Already I could feel the gears grinding at the interface between what my mind expected my body to do, pump gallons of sweat as quickly as possible, and what the demon body actually did, which was nothing. This was normal, you see, and the body I wore treated it that way. 140 degrees and drippy as a Florida swamp? No problem. Lovely day, sir and madam. Expect it might rain diarrhea later, so I brought my brolly. Hey, what? Cheerio. As I emerged from the mists near the bridge, I could see for the first time where I actually was. According to Lame's briefing, facts now stuck in my brain like some kind of half-forgotten college survey course, hell is a monstrous cylinder, wide as a small country and almost infinitely high and low. It's countless habitations piled in layers, like some impossibly huge core sample, the pith of an entire world. Abaddon, like much of hell, was sort of self-contained, was a sort of self-contained country made up of several levels, and its cities were built almost entirely from the wreckage of other cities. Well, wreckage sure seemed to describe what lay before me. Stones and mud had been dragged into new arrangements, the rubble of old towers and walls rebuilt into a thousand new shapes to make an immense insect hive with scarcely two shoulders width, width of passageway between the stacked structures. And every bit I could see teemed with hellish life. The variety of body shapes was astonishing. Some of them could hardly be called bodies in a normal sense, being little more than moving piles of goo, often disconcertingly full of power. Others wore the shapes of beasts or half-beasts or upsetting reworkings of the basic human form. One of them a short distance away from me, crawling up a muddy facade of linked and interconnected holes over flimsy ladders of wood and mud and twisted rawhide, looked like one of those giant Japanese crabs with incredibly long legs, except each of this creature's legs had a row of human hands growing down its length. 
The head, perched on top of the crab shell, was human too, and looked as if it was whistling a tune. <laughs> but now I noticed something even stranger than that. Just a few yards behind me in the mist lay the near end of the Neronian Bridge, a path that led both in and out of hell. But nobody on the hell side seemed to realize the bridge was there. I watched people walk into the mist and go right past the end of the bridge as if it were invisible. Maybe it was for them. All those people stumbling around in misery, only yards from a way out that they couldn't see. Suddenly I felt sick. If I had not yet truly realized where I was and how bad it was going to be, I began to grasp it then. There was no sky, of course. The makers of hell hadn't needed to bow to physical reality any more than the folk who built heaven. And the very shape of the place was meant to be a constant reminder of confinement and punishment. Parts of Abaddon, however, did stretch very high above me, especially along the walls of the cylinder where crude materials were scaffolded upward many times the height of a man. But above it all, was a great roof of jagged, pitted rock. We looked up at the bottom of the level above us, not at sky. Weird and new as all this was, I had very little time to drink it in. Because as soon as I stepped out of the mist, I was surrounded closely by noise and stink, bumped and jostled by some of the ugliest fuckers you've ever seen. <laughs> Worms! A froggy-looking guy with no back legs waved a sheaf of blackened, muddy sticks in the air. Crispy like you like them. <laughs> gin, swallow a gin, just a spit. This from a guy who looked as though he'd been sawed apart by a very bad magician and put back together by the magician's amateur surgeon brother. <laughs> His off-kilter eyes caught me staring. You there, you look like you need one. Guarantee you'll not have a clear thought again till last lamp. Only a single spit. Last lamp. Lame's inserted memories stirred. There was no daylight or moonlight here, so first lamp was lit to signify morning, a second at midday, and then one of those was put out, and they went back to a single lamp until day's end. And a spit was an iron coin. The gin though, was almost certainly made from something horrible and did not tempt me in the least. Hell is remarkably realistic compared to heaven, which I guess makes sense. Real nakedness, real food, real shit, real money, you name it. The fairy lights and muted pastel colors of the celestial city were looking better and better by comparison, and I'd only been in hell for a few heartbeats. The gin peddler shuffled nearer to me, offering me a cup that dangled on a piece of rawhide so long that the cup had been dragging in the dirt. I was feeling pretty thirsty, but even if that filthy thing had been the holy grail, I wouldn't have lifted it to my mouth. I could smell the ghastly odor of the gin <laughs> past the thousands of other stinks of the place, and no oblivion was worth that. I really thought that then. I changed my mind later. In fact, by the time I'd been in hell a while, I was slurping down whatever I could get, just like back in the real world. If there's ever a place where a person needs a stiff drink occasionally, it's hell. Hell and parts of Oklahoma. <laughs> but the guy with the booze was interrupted before he could finish his spiel, shoved rudely out of the way by something very large that loomed above me like an arriving bus. The newcomer was female, in an Alice's Duchess sort of way. In short, she looked like a bitter manatee in a wig. <laughs> Kitty, she rumbled at the gin peddler. This fine gentleman don't want your swill. He wants a little of the good time, say? Hey, am I right? <laughs> she leered as she bounced her breasts in her ragged box. <coughs> they looked like plastic bags of pale gravy and blue spaghetti. <laughs> Nothing like what I'll give you for a spit, Lord. I'll clean your gullies and gutters, I will. Blow the ashes right out your chimney. She hiked up her skirt to show me what was under the dress. If a hairless horse 
had as many legs as a spider, with a cruel parody of female genitalia at the juncture of each sagging, scarred pair of thighs, then, no, you don't really need to know. <laughs> it was all I could do not to vomit. Oh, lovely, she said, reaching for my prick. I suddenly realized I was naked. I mean, really realized. I turned and dove into the crowd, for the moment not caring what other horrors I was rubbing up against. Asswipe! You won't find any print here between here and the uppers! She bawled after me, cantering awkwardly in place as the bodies of her fellow health citizens pressed back around her. What, you think that you're one of the high boys? Go on and find out what they do to you, you stuck-up little turd bull! I had to keep moving, I now understood, because when you stopped, things started to crawl on you. So I pushed on through the crowds, through the filth and the howls and the unending horror zoo, past things that cringed from me and things that snapped at me, past beggars by the dozens with raised hands like mutant starfish, begging, pleading, weeping tears of blood and other unpleasant liquids. Everybody was scarred. Everybody was crippled. And not in accidental ways. These were punishments. It should have become easier to take after a while. The constant flow of maimed creatures, the hopeless and the inhuman. But it didn't. And it wouldn't for a long time. I picked up a large rock and picked up a large rock and carried it in my hand just to have some kind of a weapon. Still, as I fought my way through the crowd, I was surprised. People actually lived here in hell. They sold things. They struggled to be able to eat and sleep safely. But where were the punishments? Not the punishment of simply existing in all this hateful, overwhelming <laughs> squalor, but the actual punishments. Then it struck me. Um, and yeah, of all yeah, the ugly things, kind of I peculiar way, in the sense that I, I begin to think about all the different ways they might be, who they might be, what their history might be, and if something feels right to me, then I will start to build their history. The reason it's a little strange, though, is because at, while I'm doing that, I don't think anything about what their role in the story is going to be. I, because I find that if I think too much about their, their place in the story, then I begin to shape the character into somebody who will fit conveniently into the story. Whereas I think that certainly something that I think is part of my work, and maybe even for some people a strength of my work, is that the characters do not always fit comfortably into the story. They are very much their own people. And sometimes they are downright frustrating, not simply to the reader, but also to me as well. Because I have plans for them that they will not go along with. Because I have let them become who they are. You know? So um, I've, I've told the story before, and I won't tell it at any length. But I mean, I oftentimes plan, oh, I'll try to use this character near the end of the book for something important. And when I get very far with that character, I realize that person would never I do that in a million years. Myself. And instead of how the theology of the Bobby Dollar universe works. Not because I haven't thought it through, but because there are several different things that all seem to me equally interesting and possible, and none of them, it's like Schrodinger's cat, you know, which is about when probabilities, when everything is probability, then everything is equally true until somebody opens the box and the probabilities collapse. I have not opened that box yet. However, there are definitely hierarchies of power in this universe. There, is defi there are definitely things above Bobby that we have not seen that are as much beyond his superiors as his superiors are to him. Similarly, in hell, there are, whatever it may turn out to be, there are things in hell that are as far beyond Elagor as Elagor the horseman is from the commonest demon or even pickpocket on earth. So there are these hierarchies of difference. What they mean, I am honestly not cheating this question. They are still in my mind, it's, it's swirling around. 
for a number of reasons. So you will know when I know, basically. <laughs> and it may not be in, the, well, I don't think it is in the first three books. If I get a chance to continue writing them, there will be more revealed. And I, and I do plan to do that, so. How much time have we got?